After two years of division and deadlock, Britain is now racing towards its deadline in March to leave the European Union. In a conflict zone special this week, we look back at some of the key arguments that have shaped this often angry Brexit debate. Who was telling the truth and who wasn't? One of the accusations against the Leave side is that you consistently fail to articulate what the British economy would look like after Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, last December, we got a flash of real honesty from Nigel Farage at the Oxford Union when he said that I will accept that none of us knows what the risks are if we leave the European Union. Mm -hmm. Marvellous. Mm -hmm. The most momentous decision that the British are being required to take in 40 years and you don't know what the risks are. So no. it's sort of, fly with me and we'll see what happens, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. That's it, isn't it? The whole point is that if we... You don't put, think the country is worth more than the, that? The whole point is if we put the X in the box, in the right box on the ballot paper, we then have two years of hopefully a responsible government, hopefully a responsible t team that will negotiate a, an exit package which is... Hopefully it's a big confident. word. It's like surely, isn't it? it Maybe, is. you know, with luck. Yes. And, this is, this and is a huge gamble you want the British people it, to it's take, huge, isn't it? It's a huge gamble for both sides. A nervous time for you coming up to the uh, referendum. So nervous that you've even started to talk about what it would be like to lose, haven't you? <laughs> well, what I was actually trying to do was say that the Leave campaign has made no attempt at all to describe what a post-Brexit UK would look like. So the question I was raising was, if we were to vote to leave, which I clearly hope that we won't, what would the mandate be? Because there's a huge difference between staying in the single market or leaving it. But why but that raise it now? Because not... you sense defeat, don't you? No, I'm raising it now because I think it's really important that when people go to the ballot box on the 23rd of June, they understand what leave means. And at the moment, they, there's a black hole where but the answer to that they, question should if, be. If they vote leave, they know what they don't want. They don't want free movement. They don't want to, massive contributions to the EU. And they don't want to be governed by laws made in Brussels, do they? Precisely. That'll be, that'll be quite clear what they don't want. Precisely the point that if you... And you want to water that down? It, no, I, what I'm saying is if the op option on the table is to stay in the single market, like Norway is, not in the EU, but in the single market, you have to accept free movement of people and you have to pay into the EU but budget. But they don't want that. Is that it's what quite they want? clear that the Leave campaign doesn't oh, want is it? that. Isn't it? Uh, well, I, the last I looked, they had 23 different models that they've proposed. You've never stretched a fact in this campaign? In every campaign, some people have, and no, I don't think I ever did, but some people on both sides used good and bad arguments. But if you we saw look people at, on Vote Leave using bad arguments, people, using course, misleading, look, the, the whole misleading was arguments. The whole country was involved in this campaign, so of course there were good and bad arguments on That's both not sides. an excuse for misleading people, is well, it? I, I don't think I've misled anyone. Well, what about your campaign? Well, As course, you were a leading so, light of the campaign. Yeah, some people who were campaigning for a Leave vote used bad arguments. You were some on the campaign who were committee, didn't you rein them in? Vote. Didn't you used want to rein them in? Well, in life, we are responsible for what we do. Right? We're not responsible for every ally who might have reached the same position as us. You were a senior a member route. of the Vote Leave campaign. Mm -hmm. You were on the no, weekly by, campaign committee. You were on the weekly campaign. You set the strategy. Let's, let's, you set the strategy. You may, helped set the strategy. Please do. Well, here are a number of things that were said during the campaign that I think may now be fairly decried as false. We were told that there would be an emergency budget, that uh, there'd have to be emergency tax rises. We're now being told there'll be tax cuts. We were told that our immigration officers would be thrown out I'm of France. You to that, the French government has now said that's not going to happen. You're not responsible We've for what the other side said. I'm only going to hmm. hold you responsible for what you said and Fine. what your uh, campaign said. Hold me said. responsible for what I said. That's, Let's deal course, first with, with what appear to be radically conflicting claims by you and other leading lights in, in your campaign. Um, right after the vote, you caused something of a stir on television by saying that you favoured the free movement of workers workers to and from the UK. It means free movement of labour. You said it doesn't mean EU citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, at what point did you declare in the campaign, vote Brexit, it'll mean free movement? Throughout. At every, at every give meeting. Me an at every, well, give, actually, me, give me one example. Give me one example. Give me one example. 
if, if, if you'll allow me to, yeah. I will, Tim. Yeah. Yes, on that very programme, sitting around that very table with that very same interviewer at the start of the campaign, I had said exactly the same thing. I written a book called Why Vote Leave, which sets it all out, which sold 20,000 copies. I hardly think I can be accused which, of which sneaking this out in the small print. It'll mean free oh, yes, movement it does. of labour. Oh, yes, it does. We need, first of all, uh, the triggering of Article 50 by the government of Mrs May. And the proposal, the basic idea that I have in this negotiation is not to destroy the European Union in this exercise. Because what the British want, or what some of the British people want, because 48% have voted to what remain the in Europe, but what the government want is to make a split between uh, the freedoms in Europe uh, freedom of goods, freedom of services, freedom of capital. What they want to do is to make a split between these three freedoms and the freedom of movement of people. And we shall never accept that. The unity of the four freedoms for our citizens is a key element in this If somebody is negotiating and saying we will never accept that, so where are the negotiations? No, we will never accept to undo the European Union. You cannot expect that if the uh, British people or a majority of the British people want to go out of the European Union that we shall destroy the European Union. I have to defend the interests of the European citizens. But I have to defend the interests of the German citizens, the Belgian citizens who want to keep the European Union because it's in their advantage, yes, but let's, this let's, European let's Union. Talk about it's their this work, it's their job. Let's talk about that, what is happening. The central issue is what is more important, the single market or freedom of movement. Prime Minister Theresa May say, has said, migration from the EU will be cut. So, what will happen? You well, said I never. Think what will happen, what she wants is very clear. She has announced it in the Conservative Party uh, convention a few uh, uh, weeks ago. She announced that she wants a, a, a kind of free trade agreement uh, with the European Union. So, uh, that will be the negotiation. But what we don't... With uh, never? A negotiation when one side is saying never? No, no, no. Well, it's about a free that's, trade agreement. It's about a free trade agreement. What, what we don't, uh, what we shall never accept is to undo, to destroy the internal market, to destroy the European Union by saying to the people, okay, freedom of movement is not longer a basic principle of the Union. Nigel... Let's be honest, the freedom of movement is key for the European Union. The freedom of travel, the possibility for, for German people <laughs> to work into another country, that is the key of the European I Union understood. and we will never but destroy it. What, again, never destroy it. So where is the negotiation case? No, no, the no, that the means British are saying very clearly we don't want to have that anymore. No, and that's the reason why they want to leave the European Union. That's the point. And the question is now, what is the new relationship between the European Union and Great Britain once Great Britain has left the European Union? And that will be the, the topic of the negotiation. Hand on your heart. Is the EU even going to exist in five years' time, in ten years' time? Absolutely. As it is no now? Yeah, as it is now, even stronger. With the same members? Yeah. Having in mind that uh, five years ago we had the economic crisis, the euro crisis. We have still an economic a big, a crisis. Big challenge. It's and still a big today, challenge. And we are today stronger. We are today stronger. Really? Great having, Britain left. Having the Brexit. Banking. France having you elections. Will, you will see that the Brexit will lead at the end to a situation where people understand how important this union is. Because today not Berlin and Paris has a problem with Brexit. London has a big problem with Brexit. What I'm saying here is this. It would be a bad thing for the peoples of Europe if the political class of Europe willfully go for a bad deal with Britain because they want to punish us, they want to discourage other people from leaving the club. And I do not think that across much of Europe that the political elites are held in any high degree of regard. So you can certainly accuse me of attacking the European elites, but my goodness me, they've given me some too. All right, here, this is from the German car manufacturers. You told everyone in Britain, of course, the Germans will never allow tariffs to be slapped on their car exports to Britain. Well, they wouldn't want it. They wouldn't want it. OK, so what did Chancellor Merkel tell the world? She said the internal cohesion of the EU would come before defending German exports to the UK. The Association of Car Manufacturers says the future of the EU is more important than short-term exports. Well, do you know what? This actually plays into my hands even more. This gives, me an even, this gives me an even bigger card than I thought I had to play. Because here is my chance. They don't chance. want your card. That's what they're telling you. Oh, no, 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 no. But they again, don't want your card. Oh, come on. The relationship between big business, big banks and big politics is what it is. 
They don't want things to change. They like the status quo the way that it is. But I bet you that if we went to a bar in Munich this evening and met some German car workers and had this conversation, what they care about are their jobs. What they care about are cars being sold. It may sold be, but the bosses the aren't going to go your route just for that. I'm not talking to the bosses. I'm talking to the European people. They're the ones who make the decisions. Well, I'll tell you something. Actually, you're and wrong. And they're backing you're Merkel. Wrong. They're and ba- they're you're wrong. You're wrong. And let me tell you why you're wrong. We are due to leave the European Union at the end of March 19, OK? The European elections take place a few weeks later. What I want to try to do, there's no guarantee of success, what I want to try to do is to make sure that those MEPs who are up for re-election are asked by their electorates, are you going to vote for a sensible trade deal? Are you going to vote for our jobs? Because, you know, one thing's for certain, there are 1.3 million people in Germany whose jobs rely on exports to the UK market. So what happens if it all goes wrong? I mean, we haven't even started the negotiation. You, you said in 2015, you said in 2015, at the Oxford Union, none of us knows what the risks are if we leave the European Union. None of us knows what the risks are if we stay in the European well, that's Union. Right. So we were left to just, you know, take your bravado and your... Well, it's very simple. And your assurances. It's, no, 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 it's very simple. We're left to do that. Very simple. You could never predict the future exactly, whatever side of the referendum or at argument, all, as you said. You'd, you'd came, well, well, anyone that thinks he knows the future should be retired because mm-hmm. they should have made a fortune, you know. Um, the real question with that referendum was should we be responsible as a nation with its own identity for making the key decisions that determine our future and whether we get them right or get them wrong? genuinely, once every four or five years, have the chance to hold to account the people who took those decisions? Or do we think our future better to be a small voice as part of a bigger new state? And I've been as you know, objective about that as I possibly can be. That's what the referendum was about. And what we opted for, not by a massive margin, but what we opted for was making our own decisions and steering our own ship. And that I believe to be right in all circumstances. Here's a context which is really important. We've said that at the end of this process, when people know what the Brexit deal, what leaving the European Union might look like, when we've got a few answers that we don't have at the moment, then you give the people of Scotland a choice. And what's been fascinating is the way that that has been embraced by politicians across the European institutions and across Europe as well. The Conservative Party is almost completely united around the process of leaving the European Union, and also, by the way... On leaving, but it's the mechanics. It's the, well, the mechanics is we're in a negotiation. Excuse me, do you know the outcome of a negotiation? No, we're talking about the Thank mechanics. You. The party well, doesn't even know what it wants. The government, think, the government, the government, the government doesn't even know. You just give me the answer to my question. No, the government doesn't even know what it wants, Well, you wants, don't does either, it? so we're in the middle of a negotiation. My point is, you negotiate. That's what you do. You negotiate with the European Union. Yes. The European Union appears to know what it wants. This government doesn't well, say that, to know but what actually, it wants. I did read the other day that there are a number of people in the European Union that don't agree with the Commission. For example, uh, I think it was the Austrian finance minister, I may be wrong about exactly what job he holds, or maybe it was a commissioner, I can't remember, but he actually said quite clearly that he thought the UK was in an incredibly strong position because the European Union needed the trade. We've also had the finance... Well, he's the only one, isn't he? Oh, he's the only one. Let me finish. The finance minister of Bavaria lectured Mrs Merkel the other day about making sure that she didn't screw up the negotiations because over a million and a half jobs in Bavaria rely on exports to the UK of machine tools and cars alone. Uh, there are plenty of others. I talk to a lot of European businesses. I was talking to a person the other day that does low-tech product. He's a Belgian manufacturer. He produces potatoes. And he said the last thing we need in Europe is a tariff wall because my business would go down the tubes. I employ lots of people. I said, have you spoken to your politicians? He said, we're talking to them now. So before we just get this out of kilter, the European Union is in a position where they're not all together completely united and they also recognise that they do need a trade deal. Let How me many tell you, trade deals no, have you negotiated? Uh, uh, let me tell you, I know a bit more about trade deals than you do. Let How me many tell you, trade deals let have me you tell you something about this trade deal, all right? So just stop interrupting me and just let me tell you about a trade deal, all right? You might learn something. Here's what has to happen. As we leave the European Union, we will also re-enter the WTO as a voting member. We're a member, but we're not a voting member. Now, the schedules that are owned by the EU uh, actually have a financial tag to them. So unless they agree with us the amount of money that we pay to take some of those schedules relevant to us and lodge them at the WTO, they will end up as the EU 
spending a great deal more money for less potency. Now, here's the point. They have to settle that. That's not they might. They have to settle that at the time we leave. Otherwise, they pick up a bigger bill. So Mr. Barnier knows very well that until this, for example, is settled, nothing is settled. We are where we are. There's no point in revisiting history. Um, there's no demands in the country for a further uh, general election. What there are demands for, from I know from standing on doorsteps in my constituency, is for the UK government to proceed with the negotiations and end up with the best possible Brexit deal. So that's why all these things should be uh, very much explored. But my point is this, in trying to get a solution that placates both Remainers and Brexiteers, Britain seems to be reduced to putting forward ideas that are pretty much unworkable. Is that really the best your party can do? Well, I think that all uh, options have to be uh, on the, uh, the table. Until Even the ones are, rejected? Well, I think the understanding is, is understanding, obviously, why things are rejected. Look, the Brexit referendum has been hugely divisive in this country. And I do think one of the mistakes made um, early on was not trying to uh, acknowledge that whilst uh, the Leave campaign had won, 16 million people, 48% of those who voted, had not voted for this. So in trying to bring people uh, together to explain that we would be leaving, but we would do it in a way that was not going to uh, damage uh, completely unnecessarily people's own livelihoods and our economy. That's what we're sort of catching up to uh, now. That's what I expect to be debated both in Parliament and in Cabinet in the next few weeks. Looking back over the last two years, you were part of David Cameron's Cabinet, which approved this referendum. Why did none of you ever ask the kinds of basic questions that people are grappling with now? What if, what if we lose the referendum? What if the party splits? What if Europe applies the rules? What about the Northern Ireland border? Why were none of these questions thought about beforehand? Well, I can't say that they weren't, uh, they weren't thought about. Um, we didn't come to any were, conclusions. Well, uh, partly because I've, obviously uh, many of us campaigned in order to remain. And uh, it's difficult if you're campaigning for one thing uh, to, to gaze into the crystal ball and answer every question that's going to come up. I deeply regret uh, the result, but the result is here. Uh, we in this country obviously had a, a fair and democratic uh, vote. Uh, difficult, very difficult for people to accept. Uh, but I think it is the right thing to do to balance those two now, which is to say, yes, we are going to leave the European Union, but we're not going to do it in a way that's damaging. And if we constantly look back to the past and relive the vote from two years ago, then actually I think what happens is that attention is not given to that future relationship between the two parties, which is very important. Our, as we call it, Western system of democracy, rule of law, parliamentarism, is under stress. What happened in UK? UK, the, the origin of modern parliamentarism, moved the most important decision in, for the first decades in this century for UK from Westminster to a referendum. Crazy. Uh, there seems to have been a sense in France that this was really just a British problem and France could get perhaps some profit out of it. But that's changing now, isn't it? Um, it's not just a question of wanting Britain to suffer, although Mr. Macron suggested that he thought they should suffer, didn't he? No. He said, I mean, Brexit I mean, shows us one thing. It's not easy to excess, ex exit the European Union, not without cost, not without consequences. Is that he, false? Well, he wanted, the suggestion is that he wanted Britain no, to pay that cost. It, no, the suggestion is to, he wanted to fact, pay a cost. Leaving the EU is a complicated process. I don't think that anybody on either side of the channel would deny that. Would you, do you know? Do you know anybody who would actually say that the, the process of leaving the EU is an easy one? Well, actually, some people in this country, in Britain, certainly said it was an easy one, but they've been proved wrong. Do you believe in a, a last-minute deal, the two sides taking it right down to the wire just to show that they've extracted all the concessions I'd that like they can to, from I'd the like, others? I, I'd just like to make a point. There is no one including the president in France, who thinks that Brexit is a good thing. But there is a strong feeling in London that the French wanted maximum uncertainty for as long as possible, for one thing, to try and persuade British-based finance houses into moving uh, into continental Europe. No, we've been very, very clear from the, from the get-go about what was important to France. We've just talked about Europe. We consider that the European single market is the future of our economy. We were very clear there is one key red line, which is any deal cannot undermine that single market. My question was, do you believe in a last minute deal? Because it seems that uh, Monsieur Barnier is uh, softening some of his positions on Northern Ireland and on 
financial services? I think we should do everything in our power to find a deal. I think not having a deal would be, if not disastrous, at least very hurtful for both parties. So I think we should work absolutely consistently with one objective in head to find I, a deal. I, but I that deal cannot that, come at any price. I'm, I'm, it doesn't come at the price of undermining the single market. But that your populist movement has already, in the United States, by livening up white supremacists and neo-Nazis and increasing agree. I don't, the numbers of their organization, I don't, I don't. and with Brexit in Britain, yes. has created enormous damage to the social fabric. Mm. It's led to bitter political polarization because you've gone looking for people's grievances no. and anger, no. and you want to stir I, it up, don't I you? Want, I want to tell you that the biggest damage... You're dangerous the, the, people, the, aren't the, you? the biggest damage... You're dangerous people. Wait, wait, the biggest damage has been created by the elites or the so-called elites to the ordinary guy for the last 20 or 30 years. Look at the social fabric as it's existing today. Look at the social fabric, for example, in France and so on. Look at, at the social fabrics, you know, in the small uh, uh, English English uh, cities, for example. And, and I look want to at say, the rise and the, in hate and the, speech and since are, you populists started we are, we are not, we are not bringing We are not bringing damages. We are not bringing damages uh, to the social fabric. We are bringing damages to the elites to the establishment as it is today. That is true. And we are a threat to them. And, and they, to the society. And, 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 and polarization the, and, uh, in society. Well, the polarization didn't exist before, really. You can make really, it worse. Really. You can make really. it worse. No. You can always are, make things worse. We are, this is the problem. We you are, can start we, this, we are but you can't get rid of it. We are to represent the ordinary guy, OK? that has been so, so long despised and forgotten by these elites. And indeed, we are, we are the populists from all over the world, and the voice of this ordinary guy. I would invite Angela Merkel to follow up her offer to be compromising. Why should they look again at the deal when it said the, they've already said this is the only deal on offer, um, so that you can come back again in a couple of months and try to alter it again? Well, I mean, there's been no consistency uh, uh, from the British side, has there? I, I don't think the British side has negotiated particularly clearly, and I do, to some extent, uh, sympathise with our European partners that uh, um, Theresa May's government hasn't been very clear because of internal divisions within the, uh, within the government. Uh, Parliament has legislated that we're leaving on the 29th of March. Now, Parliament's been clear about what it doesn't want, as Theresa well, May herself says, it hasn't been clear about what it does want. Well, Parliament has so far rejected the withdrawal agreement, uh, but it hasn't rejected the uh, leave date of the 29th of March, and it remains to be seen whether it does so. But to the EU, there's very little point in negotiating with someone who manifestly does not have a mandate for the deal she's already agreed, let alone anything else in the future. Well, she has a mandate, as, as does the House of Commons as a whole, uh, to leave the European Union to fulfil the referendum uh, result. And um, I, I, as I keep repeating, the law is now quite clear in the United Kingdom and indeed in the European Union. Uh, we're leaving on that date. Now, there are people in the House of Commons who are trying to change their decision, change the decision of Parliament. Uh, they are assuming that the European Union will automatically provide some extension to Article 50. I imagine the European Union is going to want to ask what for? Uh, why are you extending Article 50? Uh, one of the draft proposals extends Article 50 for nine months. Do you really want the United Kingdom uh, to take part in the European Union elections to the European Parliament uh, when we're planning to leave the European Union just nine months later? You've been saying that no deal is increasingly attractive. But that's not what you and your Vote Leave colleagues promised the country, was it? I mean, time and again, they promised great deals with the EU and everyone else and said they, they just fall into Britain's lap, didn't they? It turned out to be nonsense, didn't it? Well, um, um, I, I have to confess that um, I think it's in the European Union's interests uh, to strike a sensible free trade deal with the United Kingdom. Um, and whether we make that agreement before we leave, which looks rather unlikely now, or after we leave, 
I believe that that's what will happen. But in the end... My point is there were a we lot leave, of broken it, promises, it, weren't well, uh, uh, there? Well, the, the Vote Leave campaign didn't make promises. We were campaigning. Well, your fellow uh, Brexiter and, and erstwhile Brexit secretary, uh -huh. David Davis, constantly boasted that both Britain's exit terms and a new free trade agreement would be wrapped up within the Article 50 time frame. That hasn't gone so well. He said at the end no. of two years, this was in 2016, at the end of two years, he said, we will have our deals. You don't have your Well, I, I think there was um, definitely overconfidence there, but I think it wasn't helped by the fact that Theresa May um, couldn't bring the cabinet together to agree what they were going to ask for and then in, and then started asking for a much more complicated arrangement than I think that uh, uh, President Tusk was originally offering in March last, last year. And then the whole Irish border question has been confected as a mechanism to try and split the United Kingdom um, which in a way that's completely unacceptable. And I don't know why the Prime Minister ever accepted the premise of that discussion. Peter Jenkins, good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you. Thank you very much.